next few minutes we'll be reviewing several procedures on videotape that have been put together for the purpose of continual education. Many times uh, I'm called upon as a consultant from veterinarians, farriers, insurance companies, owners and trainers to help them with equine foot problems. Finding it very difficult to perceive and transpose information on the phone, I have developed a consultation service that allows me to re review your case by video using radiography, hopefully teleradiology in the near future, we use the fax machine so we can hopefully review your case and come up with a constructive plan, treatment plan, that will help you in your endeavors to deal with career and life-threatening problems. This tape has is, is been designed to show explicit detail of many of the procedures that have been some of my original ideas, development and improvement of other people's ideas, concepts of friends, colleagues, and so forth. The hen shoe concept goes back as far as the Roman days. There's been many, many ideas and theories about how we can spread the horse's foot and why we should spread the horse's foot. The shoe that we will be going through is an original concept of Moan that is a, has been changed considerably over the last several years to the point that it is now something that we do routinely and regularly with consistent success. Patient selection, though, is, is very much the most important part of um, the application. Selecting the, the, the patient, usually we like to start with <clears throat> young horses, preferably very short yearlings, individuals that would be 12, 13, 14 months of age. A horse that has a very narrow foot, a long narrow foot that does not develop properly in the heels is a perfect candidate. A small footed horse is not a candidate for the shoe if they have a symmetrical foot. There's much different in the animal who has a small foot and one who has a long oval foot. There are many, many characteristics that will be found as we speak uh, through our, our main meeting concerning the conformation of feet. Ideally, though, we're looking at a unilateral situation. I've had several patients that would require two shoes uh, on front feet, and I've had one particular patient that had extremely long, narrow feet in all four. So hen shoes were applied to all four feet, but this is a, a rare situation. Another patient that we routinely will use the hen shoe on is, is the club foot. Now, with club feet, we'll have grades of one to four, and there's a lot of conformational changes in, within those individual grades. The club that has a narrow heel, that would be a two, three, or even a grade four, will be responsive to some degree to the hen shoe. By mechanically spreading the heel, the narrow heeled club, you can replace the concavity of the sole to some degree, reduce the bulging at the coronary band, reduce the fullness at the bulbs of the heel, and actually thicken the sole. You preserve the protection that's over the coffin bone. How this works, I'm not sure. Some are very responsive, others moderate, and in occasion we'll have the individual that won't respond at all. But it is a very good way to approach the individual who's responded well to the raised heel, but still has got a mismatched foot that ended up being a quarter inch narrower than the opposing foot. The process itself is, is nothing more than mechanically opening the heels, allowing the new positioning of the bars to let the frog, the bars, the bulbs, the digital cushion will all begin to remodel to that normal or, or closer to normal anatomy. Horses with very narrow heels that have had injuries, extreme thrush, canker foot, any type of disease process that they have lost the continuity of the frog, their heels come together. The good strong frog will hold the bars apart. You can take a, a natural normal foot with normal frog, remove the entire frog mechanically, 
or with disease process, and you see the heels come together very rapidly. So the value of a good strong frog is not to supply ground pressure, but it's to it holds the bars apart. You take an individual that has lost the continuity of the frog, apply a hand shoe for approximately 90 days, that frog will regenerate, come back in nice and strong, and be structurally strong enough to hold the bars apart. The hen shoe is also used on an individual that has a pinchy heel. He has a, a nice wide quarter, but the heels are very pinched up. These horses travel as if they're on eggshells many times and will be quite often diagnosed as an evictor horse. It's my thinking that under maximum load, the heels do not spread, but they are contracted and they come in and go forward. If a foot is very narrow, <clears throat> the foot cannot absorb energy because it cannot shrink anymore. A pinchy heel horse is not sore because he can't expand, he's sore because he can't shrink anymore. He cannot contract any further because he's contracted to the max. This very same an animal will respond to the hen shoe by mechanically opening the heels. Mature horses respond to this shoe as well. It's a slower process, but I've had several cases that were clubby, narrow-heeled, pinch-heeled, that responded over a period of five or six months and maintained the new structural anatomy that I've been furnished by using the hand shoe. The secret to the spreading the heels is the foot must be extremely soft. You must saturate the foot with water. In order to do that, we pack the foot with Forstners, we pack it with Valentines, we pack it with mud, whatever is necessary and convenient for the particular circumstances. The foot must be packed daily in order to provide adequate water content to the entire hoof structure to allow mechanically spreading. This is an absolute must. If you fail to establish a nice soft foot, plowable foot, you cannot mechanically reconstruct it. You can also cause damage by reconstructing, mechanically forcing a foot that is not flexible. A unilateral heel can be pushed in, particularly a medial heel on a towed out individual can roll in very hard. By pushing the heel out mechanically, you also allow the bulb of the heel to come down. This particular construction guide is designed to take you step by step in explicit detail as to how I would design a hen shoe. Once proficient at this shoe, you can allow yourself 45 minutes to an hour to construct one shoe and apply it properly. Choosing your bar stock, I normally would use 5 eighths by quarter bar stock <clears throat> or 3 quarter by quarter for the larger horse and mature horses. For my very young yearlings, I may use half by quarter, which works very nicely for a foot that measures four inches wide, approximately four and a quarter inches long. So you can either start with a, a turn blank, you can turn your own shoe, whatever you like. Anyway, measure your foot as if you are going to make an egg bar and add two inches to that normal measure. This allows you room to make a hinge and also to lap your heels, which I'll explain to you further. Crease your shoe, taking in consideration that the hinge is going to be cut out of the toe of the shoe. Also, crease and punch depending on the shape of the foot as you would normally anyway. Most of these feet need to be nailed a little further forward than would the normal foot. You must take this in consideration. Also, you've got to take in great consideration where you put the crease, because most of these narrow feet have a very thin wall. Most of these young horses are going to be turned out. Muddy conditions are going to be turned out. 15, 20 of them together, they're going to be ripping and tearing across 100 acre fields. You cannot shoe them as full as you would normally like to because you're going to lose the shoe. So you must take in consideration that crease has to be set a little closer to the outside than you would normally like to have it. Punch your hose for very small nails. Once again, these feet have narrow, thin walls. They have very vertical walls. It's quite easy to get into the circulation of these horses when you nail them. 
All these things you have to think about as you're going on because once the shoe is made, if your focus is made is toward making the shoe and not toward applying the shoe, you'll have a nice made shoe that will not nail on to that foot in a proper fashion. You cut the shoe in half, you make your hinges, simply form the hinges off the edge of the anvil, Try to make the thickness of both your hinges approximately the same so it's nice and strong. Do not make it too long, do not make it too short. You want a nice, good, strong hinge. Go to your grinder, you grind off the excess. You drill a 3 16 hole, making sure now that you put these things together as you drill them because if you don't, you can end up having a very thin part of the hinge. This hinge takes a lot of beating so you want a nice, strong hinge. Once you have made your hinge, then you place it on the foot, make a mark at the toe so you always place it in the same spot on the foot, and you shape each half to fit that foot. By doing this, you do not overuse the hinge while shaping the shoe. So I try to get it as close as possible half at a time. Remembering now, you have to go back to the same spot each time. Make a mark on the heels and turn it. I turn mine on my cams. I have large cams off the side of my anvil, which makes it very nicely. You can turn this cold. Put your mark on the edge of the cam where it just leaves the cam and turn almost a, a 90 degree angle. This angle will turn across the other side. Then I prefer to put borium on the front edge of the hinge to protect the wear and tear of the shoe. You're remembering you have taken half the stock off of the front of the shoe to make a hinge, so consequently that'll wear very quickly. Without putting the boring on, many times what happens, you wear the hinge out and you've got to replace the shoe long before it's ready to be reset. Well, that's devastating to, to you and your client because it's an expensive shoe to start with because of the time consumed making it. Plus, it's dangerous to have two pieces of shoe flopping around in the front. So you put your boring on and then you put your rivet in. If you apply your rivet first and then put your boring on, you will crystallize the rivet and many times it'll break. Now, I prefer to use a 3 16 stainless steel rivet. These are available through your hardware. They're not common to find, but they can be picked up. Now, I've tried steel, tried copper, tried a lot of different things. The stainless steel seems to work best for me. So the boring is on. If you spill over into your hole, just open it up once again using a 3 16 bit. Put your rivet in, grind the rivet down while the rivet is still hot from the grinder. Gently brat it down. Do not brat it down overly tight because you'll be doing this off and on several times through the procedure. Then you go back to the foot and you make your final fit. It's a little difficult to fit perfectly because the heels will be lapped over and you you won't be touching the heel on one side. But after a while, you become accustomed to fitting it up very nicely. Once you have the perfect fit, you go to your bandsaw and you cut through the heels. Then you level the shoe and you go back to the foot for a final adjustment. You may have made the heels a bit too long. If so, now is the time to make all adjustments. If you've turned it in too far, you straighten it out. Remember, do not abuse the shoe because the hinge will take all the action off of that hammer. Once that shoe has been fitted like you want, you want the heels to be touching. You do not want any space there. So you take your knife and cut a small notch in the toe, remembering the head of the rivet does not need to be ground off nor beat down too flat because it must be kept very strong. Now when you fit the shoe, it should fit in a proper fashion as if it were a normal bar shoe. You now make your rudders to go in against the bars. I, call, I refer to them as rudders because they're actually the mechanical push that you need to spread the heels. I use uh, approximately 12 gauge metal. You just grind it off on the corner, put a little notch in it such as this. The notch is made so that it will fit over the notch made at the sulcus of the frog. You lay these things inside the foot, 
preferably the animal will be tranquilized a bit because it's very discouraging to have them to jump by the time you're ready to fit these in. You put a little modeling clay. This is not putty now, this is modeling clay. You can get it to the dime store. Put a piece against the rudder, put both of them in. Place the shoe onto the foot in exactly the position it needs to go. Gently pull the excess clay over the bars of the heel. Do not wrap it around the shoe because you've got the weld back there, so you must not wrap it around the heel. Once this is in place, everything is snug, gently remove the shoe. Now you'll have to do this a few times to get used to not changing the position of those rudders. If they move ever so slightly, you have defeated your purpose. This particular step will save you about six hours for your first construction. It allows you to have a perfect fit with the rudders being in a position that they do the maximum push, perform the maximum push. Gently carry this to your welding table. Turn the shoe upside down. Lay a brick on the toe. Let the shoe extend out past the edge of the table so you don't disturb the rudders. Use a very hot welding rod of small diameter. Quickly touch the rudder just to stick it. Immediately go to the other side and stick the other one. If you're too slow going to the other side, heat will be carried across your shoe. The clay becomes soft. It starts to sag. Your rudder starts to move. You got to start all over. All you want to do is stick that rudder in place. If you lay down too much weld, you will pull the rudder toward the weld. It won't be noticeable to the eye, but it will be when you fit it back. Oftentimes, it's a good idea to go back and check your shoe on the foot when you've tacked your rudders in, just to make sure that nothing moves from the time you left the horse till you got them stuck. This will save you about three hours worth of work, provided you screwed things up, unspinning to everybody, including yourself. Now you're ready to put what we call the rabbit ears in. The rabbit ears are made of 5 eighths half round. You grind them down so they fit neatly up underneath the rudder. You grind down one corner, such as this. You keep fitting and looking, fitting and looking until you fill the airspace, taking in consideration where you want the bars to be attached inside. You want this, this rabbit ear to be placed over the deepest part of the sulcus. Well, that may be next to the frog or it may be next to the bar, depending on the conformation of the foot. This needs to be taken in consideration before welding them in place. Once they're made, the shoe is turned up in such a fashion that you're now looking at the bottom side of the rabbit ear. So the shoe is upside down, two little pieces of clay underneath the rabbit ears. We'll put them in the position that you want them. This modeling clay works very nicely for holding all your work in place. Spot the two rabbit ears in place. Remove it from the clay so you don't have to breathe the toxic fumes from the, from the clay because clay will burn once it gets next to that welder. Finish welding them in. Go along the sides of the rudder. Fill them in nicely, remembering not to burn through the rudders because it's the thinnest of the metal. Once this is done, you can, can grind your work off, finish it up, go back and take a look at your foot. Once all this is done, now you fit it back to the foot and you determine where you would like to have the holes drilled in the rabbit ears for the attachment of the bars. Well, consequently, one rudder may have push your rabbit ear toward the frog so you want to stay to the medial side or the lateral side. So mark this with a pin, punch it, drill it with a 7 32nd drill bit, tap it for a quarter inch bolt, dress your shoe up. I like to always go along my heels and I will, I will dress the shoe in such a fashion that I'll box off the heels so I can leave it a little full. I like to make my first shoe a bit big for the foot. If you make it a little too long, let it stick out in the front, make it a little full in the quarters, you may be able to reset this shoe with mo minor modifications 30 days later. Most shoes do not reset at all, period. Because if you have any luck 
spreading the heels, the shoe has to be drugged back approximately a quarter to half an inch to accommodate the new conformation of the foot and the positioning of the bars. If you want a perfect job, do not plan on resetting the shoe whatsoever. Now the shoe is ready to be nailed on. You measure between the holes, center to center, and this will be what we call dead on measurement. This will go in your record book. So and so horse, so and so date, right front foot, DO, inch and a quarter. That means it's an inch and a quarter between the holes, center to center. I prefer to spread one eighth of an inch at a time, approximately seven to 10 days apart. So now we'll make up approximately four bars for most cases. Sometimes I only use three of them, but I'll make up four bars to go home with the horse. The first bar will be put in place at the time of application, provided the foot is soft enough. The first bar then would be an inch and a quarter plus one eighth. So I lay my rule out, I lay my stock out. I mark all bars on the stock with a center punch. I go back and I write it, stamp it right or left, one, two, three, four. If I'm doing several horses for the same client or they're gonna be located on the same farm, I will put another stamp, which will be the initial of that individual on each bar. So as time goes along and bars get interchanged, there's no mistaking which bar goes in at which date. This is very necessary because some farms will end up having five or six animals with hand shoes on. Once the bars are made, these holes are drilled quarter inch. Clean them up so there are no birds because you want the bolt to go very freely through this hole. Do not over drill it because you lose a lot of the advantage of the bar. I like to put the first bar in after the shoe is applied. The shoe is now ready to be put on you can hot seat or you can nail it on without a hot seat. Depending on the circumstances, many times I will hot seat the shoe in place provided it fits perfectly. If it is not a perfect fit, I will either remodel it or scrap it and start all over. Do not hot seat shoes in that are not fitting perfectly in the bars because all you do is burn a hole through your bar and weaken the foot. Yes, it does fit well after it's been hot seated, but you may destroy the structural strength of the bar system so you do not have the advantageous uh, tissue that you need to work with. Nail the shoe on. Sometimes I'll put quarter clips on. Sometimes I will not. Many of these horses do not have a good wall to nail to. You've got to be very careful nailing them. Once it's applied, spread the foot, provided we have a nice soft foot in this manner. Keep the foot packed or whatever is necessary so that it is overly soft through the whole treatment period. Apply a bar every seven to ten days. Some horses you can apply them a little quicker than that, others must go longer. The softer you keep the foot, the quicker you can apply another bar. Do not cause any pain whatsoever in, in spreading this foot. If you cause pain or discomfort in any fashion, you're either spreading too much at one time or the foot is too hard. Horses can be exercised, they can be galloped, they can train at race speed, they can jump. I have seen no reason to take a horse out of training that has enough foot to nail to to keep a shoe on safely. If they're to be turned out, put them in small areas. So if they do lose a shoe, it can be found quite easily. These shoes can be reset as long as it's in the first part of the reset session. Maintenance on a shoe is a daily requirement of nothing more than looking at the shoe and tightening the screws up. There is some maintenance. It's like all other shoes. You're going to lose a few of them. It's a little more expensive than a normal shoe. I usually try to uh, to be very fair with my pricing, taking consideration the mechanical faults of the shoe is my, is my fault, not that of the horse. With cooperation from the, the farm staff, you can find the shoe to be very, very helpful for you.